Well, you used to really be scared here. Johnny. Hey, you're still afraid. Stop it now. I mean it. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Stop it. You're ignorant. They're coming for you, Barbara. Stop it. You're acting like a child. Look, they're coming for you. Look, there comes one of them now. He'll hear you. Here he comes now. I'm getting out of here. Johnny. and welcome to the Verbal Diorama episode 216, Night of the Living Dead. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. And welcome to Verbal Diorama. Whether you are a brand new listener, whether you are a regular returning listener or an irregular returning listener, however you choose to listen to this podcast or any other podcast actually, I'm so grateful and so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing to listen to this podcast. Today is going to be an awesome episode, even if I do say so myself, because we are here for the history and legacy of Night of the Living Dead. And as I'm going to come to, this movie was a bit of a surprise for me, but I'm going to explain that in a little bit. So before I do, I just want to say, as always, thank you for the amazing reception you give to all of my episodes or any of my episodes, to be honest. I always get such lovely comments from people. But the two most recent, Hot Shots and Hot Shots Part Dieu and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, two very different films, two very different episodes. And again, we're kind of doing another bit of a tonal shift from the sci-fi comedy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to out-and-out horror. And horror is something that I'm always asked to do more of. Whenever I ask for feedback from people, what do you want to see more of or actually should be here more of, I guess, on this podcast. It's always horror. People love horror movies. And so with my absolute adoration of zombie movies, it made total sense to go back to the seminal zombie movie. And this was actually the first time I'd ever watched this movie. And it's very rare that I'll do an episode on a movie that I have never seen before. So when I plan the schedule for this podcast, I plan it several months in advance. And when it came to, I'm going to do Night of the Living Dead, I had never seen this movie when I chose to do it. That's always a bit of a risk because you never know what you're going to think. You never know how the movie is going to make you feel. And so for me, I went into this completely blind. So the reaction that I gave this movie was totally unexpected. And it's totally unexpected what this movie actually ended up giving us. And in a way, I put this on the schedule, not really realising what I'd done. And now I'm even more delighted to talk about it because it feels so important and so special. And obviously it gave us the template for zombie movies to come. This movie came out in 1968, so over 50 years ago. And yet it still feels fresh despite the black and white. And it also still feels so relevant. And it's something that I want to talk about a bit later on. I actually saw the original Dawn of the Dead before I saw this one, which is a bit weird, okay. I've also seen the Dawn of the Dead remake as well, the Zack Snyder, James Gunn remake, before I saw this one. So yeah, I'm clearly not doing any of these movies in order, but it's kind of made me want to go back and revisit the original Dawn of the Dead as well, which may or may not come to this podcast. Who knows? You never know what's going to come up on Verbal Diorama. But let's just jump straight in because... The trailer for Night of the Living Dead is coming to get you, Barbara. Welcome to a night 
of total terror. <laughs> Night of the living dead, the dead who live on living flesh. The dead whose haunted souls hunt the living. The living whose bodies are the only food for these ungodly creatures. <laughs> of the living dead. A bizarre adventure in fear. An experience in shock, more shattering than your strangest nightmare. Night of the living dead. A night with the dead who cannot die. A night of total terror. Night. Of the living dead. Barbara and Johnny visit their father's grave in a remote cemetery when they are suddenly set upon by a crazed man. Barbara manages to get away and takes refuge in an abandoned farmhouse. She is soon joined by Ben, who stopped at the house in need of gas. Beset by undead creatures all around them, Ben does his best to secure the doors and windows. The news reports are grim, however, with the dead returning to life everywhere. Barbara and Ben are surprised when they realise there are five people hiding out in the basement. Married couple Harry and Helen Cooper, their sick daughter Karen and a young couple Tom and Judy. Discord sets in almost immediately with Harry Cooper wanting to be in charge. As the situation deteriorates, their chances of surviving the night lessen minute by minute. Let's as always run through the cast. We have Dwayne Jones as Ben, Judith O'Day as Barbara, Carl Hardman as Harry Cooper, Marilyn Eastman as Helen Cooper, Keith Wayne as Tom, Judith Ridley as Judy, Kyra Sean as Karen Cooper, and Russell Striner as Johnny. Night of the Living Dead has a screenplay by John Russo and George A. Romero and was directed by George A. Romero. And zombie movies, I love them, genuinely. There are some that I find easier to watch than others. For every Shaun of the Dead, which is very easy to watch and very fun, there's a 28 Days Later, which absolutely terrifies me because fast zombies are the worst. But Night of the Living Dead is often referred to as the seminal zombie film, inspiring countless others over the last 50 plus years, inspiring its own franchise and spin-offs and remakes and cementing its place in cinema history. It's not cited as the first zombie film though. That honour would go to Victor Halperin's 1932 film White Zombie, which was based on a Broadway play by Kenneth Webb. Set in Haiti, which is important, it starred a post-Dracula Bella Lugosi, in it, an evil voodoo master, played by Lugosi, uses a potion to kill a young woman who's buried and then resurrected as a zombie. While it's not as well known as others, it's widely seen as the first movie to take Afro-Haitian zombie folklore and use it as the basis for a film. This folklore originated in the 17th and 18th centuries when Haiti was known as San Domingue and was governed by France. African slaves were shipped over to work on sugar fields and the brutality of slavery in San Domingue during the French occupation was unmatched. Within a few years, half of the slaves imported from Africa were literally worked to death, which only encouraged the capture and import of more slaves from Africa. Five to six percent of slaves died every year and were refused clothing, medical care and adequate food. Disease would also sweep through the number of slaves working on the sugar fields. This relentless misery, pain and torture meant that many slaves dreamed of freedom through death, believing that death would return them to their homeland of Africa. The true horror for the Haitian slaves was the possibility that death would mean continued servitude after dying, being trapped in your body for all eternity with no power over your behaviour or desires, and thus 
the zombie folklore began. The idea that you could die, but that you'd never be truly dead, and you'd be forced to soullessly walk the earth during the bidding of a higher master, whether that be a slave master or some other master, and the inability to free yourself from the torment. Because they imagined a future in which they would remain slaves even after death, Haitian slaves saw the creation of the zombie as evidence that the cruelty that they endured was in some ways stronger than life itself. The myth would evolve when it was claimed that voodoo priests could reanimate corpses as free labour to carry out tasks on their behalf. After the Haitian Revolution in 1804 and the end of French colonialism, the fear of slavery returning was real and slavery was almost reinstated several times. And like most black history, the roots of zombies within slavery and black culture has been whitewashed over the years. But this is where Night of the Living Dead comes in. George A. Romero wouldn't even use the term zombie until his sequel Dawn of the Dead in 1978, preferring to call them ghouls. Zombie movies are ten a penny now and usually symbolise some form of apocalypse or pandemic event, where some dashing hero would find a cure and or save the day by ensuring the survival of themselves and or their group. Everyone would have hope and that hope would reap some reward. Night of the Living Dead would not only be a personal story set in a small abandoned house, with a group of relative strangers, but also a strong statement that despite your best efforts, death is inevitable. Hopes would be dashed just as quickly as the ghouls appeared in the first place. So we can't really talk about Night of the Living Dead without talking about the father of modern zombie movies, George A. Romero. Romero would found Image 10 Productions with nine friends in the late 1960s with the idea to make independent film after graduating from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh and shooting dozens of short films and TV commercials. Filmed in 16mm with his friends John Russo and Russell Striner, and their company was originally called Latent Image, and their ultimate idea was always to make a horror movie. And so they contacted Carl Hardman and Marilyn Eastman to pitch the idea. They had a company called Hardman and Associates, and they mostly did sound production, but they'd also acted in commercials in the past, so they obviously also had experience acting. And the idea for the making of this movie really was crowdfunding before crowdfunding became a thing. Latent Image would be a separate company to Image 10, but Latent Image would also be used as investment for Image 10 productions. For example, Latent Image would invest in a 35mm camera to do a tourism film to promote Pennsylvania in the autumn of 1966. That camera would be used by Image 10 for the purposes of Night of the Living Dead. It was called Image 10, as in the 10 members of the group in total. This included an attorney, employees from Hardman & Associates, and later a butcher, and they each originally contributed $600 to form the company to raise the $6,000 needed for the budget for an independent horror film. And this film would be the lowest of low budgets, with many people serving multiple roles of acting, production, crew, and also random ghouls in the background. You'll notice multiple producers, Carl Hardman, Marilyn Eastman and Russell Striner, are all credited actors on this movie. Many of the crew also served as ghouls, but actual actors were also hired too. To increase the budget, they would put together sequence reels, show them to new investors to get a bit more cash. Eventually, they would sell enough stock in the product to raise $70,000, which became $114,000 after deferments to the actors were paid. When it came to writing, Romero drew inspiration on his horror script from Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. But unlike Matheson, who starts his story with one man surviving a vampiric creature-style apocalypse, Romero wanted to start at the beginning of the story, rather than Matheson starting essentially at the end, after the apocalypse had already happened. It wasn't originally so serious, though. It started out as a horror comedy about aliens, which became aliens who consumed rotting human flesh, which, through collaboration with John Russo, became recently dead humans that consumed the flesh of the living. Romero also drew inspiration from Tales from the Crypt, which makes sense when you compare this movie to something like Demon Knight, but more on that later. Both the idea that zombies were mindless, dim-witted and ferocious, the fact that they consumed human flesh, the fact they shuffled and stumbled towards their victims, and the ways to kill them by shooting them in the head were all defining features of Romero's creations and have gone on to define the genre moving forward. Previously, zombie folklore and mythology had never linked the dead returning to life and the consumption of another living human being, with Romero and Russo actively avoiding comparisons between their ghouls and Haitian zombie folklore. 
But then you have the casting and it all comes back around to the experience of blackness. They never wrote the character of Ben as anything but a white character. He was meant to be a simple truck driver, fairly low class and uneducated, just the right person at the right time to help the scared and lonely Barbara. Friend of the producers Rudy Ritchie was lined up to play Ben until Dwayne Jones, a mutual friend of a friend of Russell Striner, visited Pittsburgh to see family in Easter 1967. Jones lived in New York and was teaching acting as well as acting himself in various theatre productions. Jones was asked to audition for Ben and everyone agreed he was the best actor for the part. And this was 1967. The year after, in April 1968, Martin Luther King would be assassinated. The civil rights movement had achieved pivotal legislative gains in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965 and Fair Housing Act of 1968. The idea of a black man being the lead character in a movie like this was unheard of and they knew there would be some parts of the US who wouldn't show the film based on this fact. Even Jones himself knew the risk of having a black man strike a white woman, of having a black man stand up to a white man and eventually shoot him of having a black man be the last man standing after this particular night and of the ultimate ending of this movie, which would have been shocking had Ben been a white character, but as a black character adds so many more layers of racial and political commentary. But I want to come back to that ending, which is an ending of a movie that you will never forget a little bit later on in this episode. Due to the low budget, filming was set up on remote spots in rural Pennsylvania at the Evans City Cemetery, and a house set to be demolished. Because they were outside city limits, they didn't need any special permits to film. It also meant they could damage this house as much as they needed to because it was going to be demolished eventually. The house didn't have the necessary fireplace or basement though. A hearth was built by Vince Savinsky, the business manager for Leighton Image. The door leading to the basement was a hole cut in the wall with a door added. And the basement itself was the basement of their building on Fort Pitt Boulevard in Pittsburgh. The furniture was from Goodwill and everybody contributed something to dressing the house to make it look like an actual home. Even costumes were from Goodwill or clothing owned by cast members. Most of the shoots were at night and the hardest was the escape sequence out of the farmhouse as it involved fire and explosions, which means if you screw up a take, you have to do all of that again. They only had two trucks for that scene, bought for $35 each, and luckily they got the shot in one take. That previously purchased 35mm camera came to good use and it really was a production that just made do with whatever they had. They had two 35mm Ariflex cameras, one in a blimp, quartz lights, one Nagra tape recorder and one microphone. The sound is all location sound, there's no dubbing other than a few words in the escape sequence. They would never roll both cameras simultaneously. Makeup was done by the producer actors playing Harry and Helen Cooper. And the makeup gets better as the film progresses because they got better at applying it. They progressed to using mortician's wax to simulate wounds and decaying flesh. Filming took 30 days over a seven month period between July 1967 and January 1968 because they would shoot for a couple of weeks, then break, filming around their commercial schedule and financing. It made continuity difficult, but there was no other way around it because this was a low budget horror movie. The decision to shoot in black and white was also for budgetary reasons. Colour film was more expensive, but it was harder to get a black and white film distributed, especially in 1968. They did have an opportunity to switch to 16mm colour film after a week of shooting in black and white 35mm, with the option to reshoot the first week or stay with the black and white. But Romero felt the black and white film was more gritty and gruesome. And additionally, colour TV was still a luxury at that point and the blood looked more realistic in black and white, what with it being chocolate syrup and all. The producer, who was also a butcher, donated entrails, other offal and joints of meat so that when the actors were chowing down on other human beings, they were actually eating things like ham on the bone and stuff like that. During filming and post-production, members of Image 10 helped with prop construction, sound recording, loading camera magazines, gaffing and editing. Carl Hardman photographed and printed the production stills and the cast members set up a queue in the darkroom to develop, clean and dry the prints as he made the exposures. A total of 1,250 pictures were taken throughout the production. And although they had a script, it wasn't really a finished one. Dwayne Jones would heavily influence the characterization of Ben, making him more resourceful and intelligent. 
Jones was a very well-educated man. He was fluent in a number of languages. He was a BA graduate of the University of Pittsburgh. He dabbled in writing, painting and music and studied in Norway and Paris. He was also completing a master's in communications at NYU between shooting Night of the Living Dead. And Dwayne Jones simply refused to do the role as it was written. And since the character was never written with a black man in mind, there's no mention of his race. And yet his blackness adds more nuance and tension to scenes and more risk, especially when he strikes a catatonic Barbara. Jones always knew it would be risky to have a black man hit a white woman. And even during filming off camera, Jones was very much aware of the racial impact of him starring in this movie. In an interview with Tim Ferrante in 1987, which is featured on the Criterion release, he would relay a story about a ride home from set with a white female extra. He would say, quote, We were driving through downtown Pittsburgh of all places and heading back to Duquesne, when all of a sudden we became very aware of the fact that there were some teenagers in a car following us. And at first we thought it was some of the young folks who were around the filming. And I looked back and I said, Betty, those are strangers. And then I looked back, one of them started brandishing a tire iron at me. And the paradox and the irony of that, I'd been walking around brandishing a tire iron at ghouls all day long, and there was somebody brandishing a tire iron at me from a car, but in absolute seriousness. And that moment, the total surrealism of the racial nightmare of America being worse than whatever that was we were doing as a metaphor in that film, lives with me to this moment. End quote. The script itself was more guidelines than rules. When Barbara is telling Ben all about what happened to her brother Johnny, that was all ad-libbed by Judith O'Day and was filmed in one take. And it is quite fascinating because clearly the start of the movie is set up for Barbara to become the lead, to become the quote-unquote final girl. But there is no final girl. Barbara is set upon by ghouls, including her undead brother Johnny, and Ben is left alone in the house after ensuring the Coopers are all dead retreating to the cellar just as Harry Cooper predicted. Harry Cooper was no hero, he was a coward. He would have sacrificed any member of that house to save himself, in contrast to Barbara's pitiful near-constant hysterics and later her catatonic inarticulacy. Ben is a source of calm and logical focus. In addition, Jones's performance establishes Ben early on as being by far the most articulate and sensible of the film's characters the only one with a workable plan for surviving. And as Ben emerges from the cellar the next morning after everyone else has been killed, our hero, a black man, is shot dead by a group of white men going around killing ghouls. He's not killed for being black, but mistaken for an undead creature. But it sure does invoke images of black people being killed, being lynched. It's not a racially motivated murder, but it still feels like it. And the ending hits so hard. Had Ben been white, yes, it would have been a shock, but Ben being black, slain by white rednecks, feels like the ultimate commentary on 1960s America. And in fact, America full stop. A black hero, unafraid to stand up to Harry Cooper, a white man, and show ingenuity, confidence and bravery on this night to end all nights, just becomes another body on the pile of bodies on the funeral pyre. The ending is visceral and honestly, absolutely heartbreaking. It's immortalised Dwayne Jones, the character of Ben, and the movie, which is already genre-defining, quite literally into the condemnation of racism in America. By April 1968, they had a finished film to show distributors. The film was at that point called Night of Anubis. And as we all know from The Mummy, aka the greatest movie ever made, Anubis is one of the ancient Egyptian gods of the dead, and Imhotep himself was buried at the base of the statue of Anubis. The response to the movie was mostly positive, but the response to the title was less so. Some distributors didn't agree with the graphic and gruesome scenes and insisted on cuts. They wanted a happy ending to be shot instead. Both Columbia and American International Pictures would ultimately decline after Image 10 refused to make those changes. After Night of Anubis, the movie was renamed Night of the Flesh Eaters, but was renamed Night of the Living Dead by the eventual distributor, the Manhattan-based Walter Reed Organization, because a different movie with a similar name called The Flesh Eaters had already been made and released in 1964. The Walter Reed organisation agreed to release the film uncut and uncensored, but the copyright notice was unintentionally removed from the movie's early releases when the title was changed. And again, I'm going to come back to this because the film's public domain status is one of so many fascinating things about this movie. 
Not only does it mean you can find it anywhere online, it also means it's been remade, resold and redone countless times. Something that I've done on this podcast countless times is the obligatory Keanu reference. And it doesn't get any easier, trust me. So this is a part of the podcast where I try to link the movie that I'm featuring with Keanu Reeves for no reason other than he is the absolute best of men. And this is really tough because how do you link Keanu Reeves to a movie that came out when he was four years old? It's, it's kind of impossible, but in an interview with Stephen Colbert, Colbert asked Keanu what he thinks happens when we die. And Keanu probably did mumble something about returning to feast on the flesh of the living, but he actually didn't. But he did give the proper answer of, I know the ones who love us will miss us, which is really sweet and a very Keanu response. But really, I think he meant he would return to feast on the flesh of the living. And that really is the best you're going to get <laughs> from the obligatory Keanu reference this week, I'm afraid, because, yeah, it was really tough. Hopefully next week will be a little bit easier. So, on the 1st of October 1968, at a packed Fulton Theatre in Pittsburgh, the world premiere of Night of the Living Dead was met with a standing ovation. It was shown nationwide as a Saturday afternoon matinee, and this was typical for horror films at the time. It also drew quite a young audience of preteens and adolescents. And because the MPIA film rating system wouldn't be implemented until the following month, even young children were allowed to buy tickets to see this movie. But it also meant that this movie was a huge success. On its final $114,000 budget, it's estimated to have made over $30 million, with $12 million gross domestically in the US and $18 million internationally. In 2022 money, that's $941,800 and $247.8 million respectively. It's one of the most profitable films ever made, and this is despite the fact that due to its public domain status, it would mean that those responsible for the film, such as George A. Romero, would see little of those profits. Nor would he make any money from the countless home video and DVD releases. Ironically, though, Night of the Living Dead's constant TV airings and accessibility ensured that more and more people saw the movie and essentially is what made it the treasured classic that it is today. It's also been colourised, remastered and modified numerous times with the first colourised version coming out in 1986 with Green Ghouls and in 1997 with Grey Ghouls. More colourised versions arrived in 2004 and 2009 with the latter also being converted into 3D. In 1999, John Russo released Night of the Living Dead 30th Anniversary Edition which had additional scenes filmed and a revised soundtrack by Scott Vladimir Lucina. This version is, according to the internet, widely disliked. A 4K digital restoration from original camera negatives and audio track elements was undertaken by the Museum of Modern Art and the Film Foundation. This version was also released on Blu-ray by the Criterion Collection in 2018, including Night of Anubis, a work print edition of the film that had never before been seen. This restoration had been supervised by Romero, Russo, sound engineer Gary Streiner and producer Russell Streiner. After Night of the Living Dead, Romero released 1978's Dawn of the Dead, 1985's Day of the Dead, 2005's Land of the Dead, 2007's Diary of the Dead and 2009's Survival of the Dead. Each movie charts the development of the epidemic of the living dead in the US and humanity's vain attempts to deal with it. Dissatisfied with the endings of both Diary and Survival, Twilight of the Dead was written by Romero and Paolo Zalatti, but since George A. Romero's death, it is going to be the only sequel to not be directed by him, and it is still in development by his third wife, Suzanne Desrochet Romero. There's also the alternative sequels, which came after a dispute between Romero and John Russo, starting with The Return of the Living Dead in 1985, then Return of the Living Dead Part 2 in 1988, Return of the Living Dead 3 in 1993, Return of the Living Dead Necropolis in 2005, and Return of the Living Dead Rave to the Grave also in 2005. The first and only official remake, the 1990 Night of the Living Dead, was directed by special effects artist Tom Savini, with Tony Todd as Ben and Patricia Tallman as a more capable and strong Barbara, as opposed to the passive catatonic Barbara from 1968. It came about mostly due to issues over profits from the 1968 version. 
Romero collaborated with John Russo and Russell Striner for the first time in 20 years on the remake, but persuaded Savini to direct it. Saying this, though, it didn't actually make that much money. Only $5.8 million on its $4.2 million budget. It also has a totally different ending, with Barbara surviving the night and Ben being killed and becoming a zombie. Night of the Living Dead 3D was directed by Jeff Broadstreet in 2006 and wasn't affiliated with Romero or Russo or anyone from the original at all due to the public domain status. There's also Night of the Living Dead Darkest Dawn, an animated remake, also starring Tony Todd as Ben, Night of the Living Dead Resurrection, A Night of the Living Dead, Rebirth, formerly Night of the Living Dead Rebirth, Night of the Animated Dead, Night of the Living Dead 2, A Night of the Undead, literally the list goes on and on. And because this movie is out there in the public domain, literally anyone can pick up this movie, copy this movie, remake this movie, change this movie, put this movie out as their own. It is literally there for everyone to do anything with. And so that's what people have done. There's a lot of Night of the Living Deads out there, but there is only one original and that is the 1968 version. Let's move over to some social media thoughts. I like to ask on social media what people think of the movies that I feature. And surprise, surprise, there are a ton of comments for this movie. Actually, it is no surprise at all because I fully expected it. So we've got a lot to go through. So I'm going to go through them as quickly as possible. We're going to start with the patrons. And we're going to start with Danny, who says, The OG of zombie media, ahead of its time and still a classic to watch today. And obviously, I do like to give patrons who have podcasts a little bit of a plug for their podcast. And Danny, well, Danny has a few podcasts, but I want to specifically mention One Minute Podcast Tips because it is a great podcast for if you make your own podcast. Danny works for my podcast host, Captivate. So if there's anything to learn about podcasts or making a podcast, you go to Captivate and you go to Danny. So I will put some information for that podcast in the show notes. We also have perennial commenter Andy, who says, While Romero would seriously ramp up the gore and mutilation in the subsequent instalments of the Living Dead series, the original excels at creating tension, sharing the claustrophobia felt by our characters, and adds very serious social commentary. An all-time banger. And you know what else is an all-time banger? Andy's podcast, Geek Salad, is an all-time banger. So I will also put some information in the show notes for that as well. Brett says, this is truly the origin of one of the most insane subgenres in history. Romero didn't just give us a zombie film. He gave us true tension, fear and social commentary that was way beyond what we would expect to see in 1968. A masterclass that would be the foundation for what we see with the horror genre today, cementing Romero as the quintessential horror master. And again, Brett also has a podcast. His podcast is called Dissect That Film. And I will also put some information for that in the show notes too, if you're interested in listening. Brendan says, A masterpiece as compelling and watchable today as it was more than half a century ago. Romero codified one of the most enduring movie monsters in cinema history with a sharp script and blistering, accidental or not, social commentary and harrowing pacing. A classic for a reason. And the final patron comment is from Sam, who says, the lack of a blockbuster budget is obvious in all aspects above the line, but when your story and direction is years ahead of its time, then it becomes irrelevant. Stone Cold classic that created so many blueprints for how zombie films could easily be effective. 9,278 out of 10,000. And Sam is the host of Movie Reviews in 20 Qs. It's a wonderful podcast. It's so funny. It always makes me laugh so much. I will put information on movie reviews and 20 cues in the show notes too. We're going to jump straight into Twitter and we're going to start with at the underscore film underscore B who says, I love this film, even though it genuinely creeps me out. It's an absolute classic. At real underscore Mr. Positive says, in one word, with a gif, terrific. At Holmes Movies Pod said, a classic and subversive film, an influential horror film and also influential for aspiring filmmakers. George A. Romero really tapped into some real fears. It was released during a very turbulent time, but today it doesn't feel dated. All its themes feel so current and relevant. At Dude underscore Exactly said, One of the most influential horror films and in many ways ahead of its time. A great example of the way horror films can be used as commentary on society. 
at Cherry Bombs Pod said, Greatest horror film ever made. At Movie Duel Pod said, It's simply seminal. The template for not just modern zombie movies, but modern horror in general. Maybe not entirely intentional, but it has a lot of social commentary around toxic masculinity, race and sexism. Not to mention it's scary, gross and bags of fun. At KJ Evans 2 said, Classic, oft copied, rarely bettered. The ending packs its punch. At Thief CGT said, It's my favourite zombie movie and my number three horror film. Love it. At Swayze of Arabia said, Night of the Living Dead was the movie that made me fall in love with not only the horror genre, but the works of George Romero. I love the feel of this movie. It feels like you're watching newsreel footage of the Vietnam War instead of a low-budget zombie movie. Moving over to Instagram, we have at Friendly Sparpod who said, I first watched this in college in a history of sci-fi cinema class. I was thoroughly impressed seeing how a lot of the tropes we associate with zombie films and even the horror genre as a whole originated from this movie. No comments over on Facebook, but we have comments on threads. So we're going to start with somebody I should have put in the patron section. (laughs) And Derek, I apologise. I think because what happens with threads is there is no way for me to copy and paste the text from threads into the episode notes. So instead, what I've done is I've actually copied and pasted a screenshot. And because of that, I apologise, Derek, because I've just realised I should have put you in the patron section and I didn't. So just just pretend that I've not done wrong. Let's just pretend I'm talking about the patrons And the final patron comment is from Derek, who says, I haven't seen it in a very long time, but it undoubtedly has a major mark on popular culture, creating the template for the zombie horror subgenre. While humankind have been telling myths, legends and folklore around animated dead for thousands of years, this movie innovates those legends into the terrifying zombie apocalypse, which every zombie story afterwards owes a debt. The question for you, when the zombie apocalypse happens, do you have your plan in place? I mean, surely the standard response for a zombie apocalypse is always take the car, go to mum's, kill Phil, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a cold pint and wait for all of this to blow over. Which, by the way, I only realised in doing the research for this particular movie, the whole we're coming to get you, Barbara line from Shaun of the Dead is based on this movie. I had no idea. Anyway, Derek also has a podcast. He co-hosts The Midnight Myth with his wife, Laurel. They are amazing. They should have been in the patron section. Again, apologies for that. But I will put information in the show notes for The Midnight Myth, and I will also put them in the patron section for this episode in the show notes. We also have a comment from Neil G78 on threads who says, Only one of the greatest films of all that kick-started the zombie genre. The social commentary is on point with an ending that still packs a punch all these years later. A masterpiece. And the final comment on threads goes to Pulp Serial, who says, I'm excited for this episode. I remember being the huge nerd that I am and walking around school the day after I saw it, saying to all my friends, they're coming to get you, Barbara. And as always, a huge thanks to everyone for your comments on Night of the Living Dead. Obviously, if you do want your comments read out, comment on the posts that go up on social media. They normally go up every Friday. And they are available on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and also threads as well. And next time I will try to do threads maybe a little bit differently to try and pick up on those Patreon comments. But I am at Verbal Diorama on all of those areas and you can find me and you can comment on there. So as I said at the start of this episode, this was the first time I'd ever watched this movie. And it was something that I'd more or less put off for a long time, mostly because I knew it would terrify me. And it did terrify me, by the way but not for the reasons I was expecting. The independent B-movie quality, the black and white, almost documentary feel, just FYI, I did not watch the colourised version, uh, just the original black and white. It's available for free here in the UK on the BBC iPlayer service, but to be honest, it's also available on YouTube as well. So I just happened to watch the black and white version, not the colourised version. But the fact it was that black and white documentary feel immediately put me on edge a little bit because black and white movies automatically feel different to someone who's lived with colour TV pretty much all of their life. The claustrophobia of the farmhouse setting, the fear in everyone's eyes, the tension, 
the gore, the ultimate shock ending, it terrified me. Not because I was scared of the ghouls or the tension, because I love the practical effects, the makeup, all of that. That's very much my bag, baby. But that ending, the ending that came out of nowhere. And from watching zombie cinema over the years, and I've not watched everything, to be fair, but we're conditioned by decades of zombie media to believe that our hero will survive. And the fact that Ben didn't, that's going to stay with me forever. That final scene with Ben is forever ingrained in my memory. It's one of those movie endings that I think anyone who's seen this movie will never forget. And I will certainly never forget the ending to this movie. There's a reason this is considered the seminal zombie movie and the fact it revolutionised the horror genre. It gave us horror as social and political commentary. This was an America divided, not just by race, but by the war in Vietnam and the general horrors of that era. With the assassinations of both Malcolm X and Martin Luther King fresh in the minds of many Americans, but especially black Americans, it's easy to see how this movie is both seen as fresh, revolutionary and nihilistic. The creatures may be created from radiation, but the real horrors are what human beings do to other human beings when they're alive, not after their death. Evil characters don't mean death and good characters don't mean survival. Literally everyone in this universe is doomed. And Dwayne Jones' Ben continues to be a rarity, the African-American everyman character. An actor purely cast for his abilities, not the colour of his skin. In the hashtag Oscars so white era, black actors were rarely recognised by mainstream award bodies for playing any role other than extraordinary historical figures like Harriet Tubman or figures rooted in centuries-old racial stereotypes. But Ben is the exception to that rule. His casting would lead to other black horror leads going against the stereotypical black character dies first in a horror movie, such as the always recommended Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, which has a black female lead, and even more modern fare like Jordan Peele's Get Out. You could argue something like Candyman as well, even though while Tony Todd is terrific in Candyman, Candyman is not about the black character in that movie. It's about the white female character in that movie. So it is ever so slightly different. Even when the casting of a black man was unintentional, the inclusion of race makes the movie feel much more impactful and keeps it ingrained in our minds. Because even now, more than 50 years later, a young person watching this movie might watch it and see Black Lives Matter, see George Floyd with a knee on his neck. They won't necessarily associate this movie with the Civil Rights Act or Martin Luther King. So this movie will remain constantly relevant, just as, unfortunately, racial injustice remains constantly relevant. Night of the Living Dead was a huge hit when it came out. It's gritty realism, Romero's guerrilla style of shooting, and it brought terrifying action into the realm of plausibility and combined introspective horror with previously unheard of levels of gore. But the disturbing realisation is that the apocalyptic nightmare that we were all submitting to in 1968 wasn't actually all that unfamiliar. George A. Romero will forever be remembered for incorporating all the societal tensions and anxieties from the 1960s into what would become groundbreaking horror cinema. Romero created the genre, decade and societal defining horror movie of all time and he had no idea he was doing so. Some people set out to make a statement, and others, they just make it. Thank you for listening. As always, I would love to hear your thoughts on Night of the Living Dead. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you want to get involved and you want to help this podcast grow, you're doing so just by listening. But you could also help by sharing this episode or this podcast with friends or family members. You could leave a rating or review wherever you found this podcast. Or you could just pop on social media. I'm at Verbal Diorama, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, threads, and also Letterbox too. And you can also retweet or like posts as well. That always helps with visibility. And I always like to recommend other episodes of this podcast. So if you have liked this episode, you might also like episode 56, Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight. Now, Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight is one of those wonderful films that I just simply adore so much. And whenever it comes to the possibility of recommending it, I always will because it's campy, it's fun, it's got some great practical effects in it. But also, it felt very important because of the character played by Jada Pinkett Smith. 
Jada Pinkett Smith is obviously a black woman. And it felt completely fresh and completely different and subversive to have a black woman as the main character in that movie. And it is an important character as well. She's not just a secondary character. She is the main character in that movie. It's also got a fantastically camp Billy Zane performance. And who doesn't love a camp Billy Zane performance? But it is terrific. It is a lower budget movie. It's a Tales from the Crypt movie, so it's not going to be something that a lot of people have heard of. But genuinely, if you come across Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight, you will love that movie. And you will also see, as something that I've now realised, it does link back to Night of the Living Dead in so many ways. I just never realised before because I'd never seen Night of the Living Dead before. But there's a great two-parter. Yeah, you get the super serious Night of the Living Dead and then you get the camp fun Tales from the Crypt Demon Night. That would be perfect movie night for me, in all honesty. And then I also want to recommend some more modern zombie movies that I've covered on this podcast. Episode 178, One Cut of the Dead, which is a Japanese movie about making a zombie movie. And it's really interesting. I don't want to spoil One Cut of the Dead, but it's so much fun. It's so genuinely scary. And then it flips everything on its head partway through. It's so great. And then one of my favourite movies ever, actually, episode 179, Train to Busan, which is a South Korean zombie movie. But it's not about the zombies. It's about the human characters on this train, interacting with each other, social differences, power, responsibility, how we treat each other. It just so happens to also have zombies in that are absolutely terrifying. Again, fast zombies, scary. But I love Train to Busan. I always recommend that movie to anyone who wants a great movie, just full stop. Not just a great zombie movie, but it is wonderful. And yeah, get past the one inch barrier of subtitles because there are some great movies, as I've said, from Japan, from South Korea, that deal with zombies in such a unique and different way. So I would recommend all of those. Give me feedback. Let me know what you think of my recommendations. And the next episode hasn't replaced another episode. Oh no, this one's been here the whole time. You just forgot about it. And the next episode is actually kind of unforgettable because it's going to be Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And it is a movie that always makes me question myself. It always makes me question what I would do in that scenario. And to be honest, that makes a good movie for me. I think Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is a bit of a masterpiece, if I'm honest. What would you do to forget the pain of a past relationship? Would you erase your memories of that person forever? And how would you deal with that erasure? It's something that I've thought about a lot because let's be honest, my relationship history has not been all that great. And I often wonder to myself, what if I just deleted that person from my memories? What if I never had to think about that person ever again? What if all of that pain could just be removed with like one single session? And it really is something interesting to ponder. And I think it's something that we can talk about in the next episode. So please join me next week for the history and legacy of Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And obviously, just by listening to this podcast, you are supporting it. Thank you so much for doing so. But if you do want to help financially, you can do so by going to verbaldiorama.com slash Patreon or verbaldiorama.com slash tips. The Patreon is a subscription where you pay whatever you want a month. Or you can go and do one-off tips if you've enjoyed this episode or you just want to, I don't know, buy me a coffee or something like that. You can do that at tips. But as always, a huge thank you to the amazing patrons. To Simon E, Sade, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Vern, Kat, Andy, Mike, Luke, Michael, Scott, Brendan, Ian, Lisa, Sam, Jack, Dave, Chris, Stuart, Sonny, Nicholas, Zoe, Kev, Pete, Heather, Danny, Ali, Tyler, Stu, Brett, Philip, and Michelle. I have a merch store. It's verbaldiorama.com slash merch. You can also email me verbaldiorama at gmail.com. You can say hi. You can give me feedback or suggestions, or you can go to verbaldiorama.com, or you can find what I do at filmstories.co.uk. You can find the magazine that I write in and articles as well. And finally, You, drag that out of here and throw it on the fire. Nothing down here. All right, go ahead down and give him a hand. It's 
go check out the house. Man. There's something in there. I heard a noise. All right, Vince, hit him in the head, right between the eyes. Good shot. Okay, he's dead. Let's go get him. That's another one for the fire. Bye.